Naturally, being the first time in the new building, my mind has slipped back a few years and uh, over the years, and it is lovely to share with you tonight and uh, this lovely building. I haven't been all the way round, but I'm going to have a little inspection perhaps afterwards. I understand it's very smart in every way. Even got curtains around the dustbin, I believe. But uh, however, it's it's honouring to have a place to meet, isn't it? And we do trust that the Lord will bless. Thank you for your prayers, and may I just, in two minutes, update you concerning the radio work, and then we will look at the Word of God. At the present moment, we have um, eight programmes going out each week, and we're now in the 16th year of broadcasting. Those days have slipped by very quickly. And uh, now we have about, yes, eight programmes going out. They're going off tomorrow, actually. I've just been do working on them today a bit. And... Uh, the programs now go, more or less, go round the world. They sort of go in circle the globe. And we do value your prayers. The um, latest program that we have, for a number of years, for about six years, we were on a pop radio station in Swaziland in South Africa. And then our agent suggested that we might come off because they were doing one or two things on this radio which was a little illegal and contravening international radio laws and etiquette. So they decided we shouldn't get mixed up with that. And so uh, we came off that particular program. But about eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago now, we went back on into Swaziland, but this time we're now on the national radio of Swaziland, which is about six times the coverage of the previous one. And I understand it reaches about, or covers about 80 million people. And we've had letters this week. It goes, uh, it covers South Africa, Swaziland, of course, uh, Mozambique, and it also covers Madagascar, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, and these new names. But we've had two letters this week from Uganda, so it's even gone a little bit further than we thought. And then also our latest program coming from New Orleans in uh, South America, southern parts of the states rather, uh, southern part of North America. Um, that comes to Europe, and, uh, but it's reaching a much wider area than we thought. Somewhere about five or six weeks ago we had intimation that this is the same program, Somebody was listening to it in Wellington in New Zealand, while someone at the same time was listening to it in Hangar in Norway. So they couldn't be much further apart. And that night we had a letter from Frinton on Sea, which is a little bit nearer home. So that we have had one or two letters from Britain, of people, people, but mainly on the Essex side, on the eastern side of the country. So uh, Enfield in London, then going out to Clacton on Sea and, and that area. So it is probably, that's probably where it's a little stronger. I picked it up down where we are at home there. And uh, it is possible to, to get it sometimes. It's nine o'clock on a Sunday evening. It's a bit patchy, but uh, if you're interested and want to know where to get it on the dial, see me afterwards and I can tell you where you can have it going. But whether you get it or not in this part, I couldn't guarantee. But if you'd like to, mention it after. So we do value your prayers and thank you for your prayers. And now to, I'd like to speak tonight in the light of uh, a word that we hear uh, going around and it's on the lips of politicians, it's on the lips of the news readers. That's the word recession. I suppose the opposite to the word recession is the word prosperity. And I want to speak about prosperity tonight. And I want to take you to a verse in the Bible where it actually, the word does come. And uh, I want to, in the light of perhaps your effort in a year or so's time, if the Lord tarry, that it might be a time when God will prosper the effort. But meanwhile, that the Lord may, and at the beginning of a new year, because we're still in January, that I would like to wish you a prosperous new year, prosperous in the true spiritual sense. Now, I have chosen to illustrate this term tonight. One of the loveliest characters in the Bible and one of the fullest biographies that we have. And uh, I would like to read just two portions. First from Genesis chapter 50. And we're reading now a little about Joseph. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 22. The last paragraph of Genesis. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machiah, the son of Manasseh, were brought up on Joseph's knees. That expression, the Joseph's knees, is an Eastern expression. When a grandfather blesses his grandchildren, he sits down cross-legged. 
and the grandson comes in and he puts his right hand out where the legs cross and he bows his head and father puts his hand on the back of his neck that's why of course Esau put uh, those pieces of skin in those particular places and that's the way of blessing so obviously here he had the privilege and the joy of blessing his own uh, uh, grandchildren on, at his knees and uh, it said this and Joseph, verse 24 Joseph said unto his brethren I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now will you go to the last chapter of the book of Joshua? And at the end of his life, Joshua had gathered the people at a place called Ephraim. He gathered the people together as his last instructions to them, reminding them of the goodness of God. And then and we read in verse 29, And it came to pass, after Joshua had spoken to the people, And it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. So he died at the same age as Joseph died. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sirah, which is in the Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived or outlived Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. May the Lord bless those two selected readings. I'm sure you see the obvious connection. Joseph, this man was this particular biography that's given to us one of the fullest biographies in scripture Joseph means increasing the idea of the word Joseph like for instance you drop a pebble into a pool you get the increasing uh, ripples going out and making an impact as they widen and widen and this was very much like the life of Joseph Le Joseph's life was a life like that where in, in increasing circles he had an impact wherever he went. And in the 39th chapter of Genesis, we read these words. And Joseph was a prosperous man, and the Lord was with him. When Tyndale translated his scriptures, uh, that was before, of course, the authorised version, probably about 60 years beforehand, or a little less. And as he translated the scriptures, he used the same text that they used in 1611, and as he, used, as he translated that verse, and he translated it like this, and Joseph was a lucky fella. That was the way he put it in Old English. But the idea behind luck, of course, luck today is a word that we, we don't keep in our vocabulary. But in those days, it had the idea of a smile upon a person's life. And it's very much connected, in a sense, with the Old Testament idea. The Lord's face to shine upon you. And uh, that was the sort of idea. And so jo uh, Tyndale used that expression. But when we come to our version, and Joseph was a prosperous man. And what a lovely word to be able to use in days of all the seemingly and so-called recession, etc. Real prosperity. So I want to see tonight for a little while why it was that why it was possible that God could bless such a man. Now I have to be very careful in saying this because. I am very much aware, and I perhaps you are too, but I am very much aware in my own life that God blesses me in spite of what I am and what I do. God is gracious, and uh, I can have no claim so often to many of the blessings of God. Yet, on the other hand, the believer has certain responsibilities that as he serves his master, I think that there are scriptural principles that if we are in where God wants us to be, doing what God wants us to do, at the time God wants us to do it, then God can prosper us even more. 
So there is the human side as well as the divine side. And of course they make the complete, the complete coin. But Joseph was a prosperous man. And at the beginning of a year, I want us to see some of the reasons why it was that God could bless Joseph in the way that he did. We go back to the 37th chapter of Genesis. And there, as we come to that chapter, which I suppose every Sunday school teacher at some time or other has touched upon and has mentioned and has uh, brought before boys and girls. That is the chapter where we read about Joseph at the age of 17. Now this young man, he was very, very close to his father. His father loved him and there was an affinity that was quite much stronger than that than the rest of his, uh, his children. And there was probably three human reasons why this was so. Three deaths in the family, I think, in a natural sense, would have thrown father and son closer together. First there was the death of Joseph's mother. Then there was the death of Joseph's nurse, godly nurse. And then there was the death of Joseph's grandmother. And these three deaths, naturally, I would imagine, would bring, bring father and son closer together. But there was much more to it than that. This young man, there was something outstanding about this one whose name meant increasing. You know, the Jewish writers and the rabbis, when they write about Joseph, even old Josephus, he does the same, when they write about Joseph, and I think the scripture, the tenor of scripture supports their idea, they always talk about Joseph being a very highly intelligent young man. In modern parlance, he would have a very high IQ, very intelligent. And this was a natural talent that God obviously had given to him. We see hints about this talent was even used in the way of the administration of the family business, of rearing the flocks and the herds, etc. And we find a hint of that in the 37th chapter of Genesis. But the time came when this young man when jealousy was the hallmark of his brothers, jealousy came in and they hated his brother. They called him the dreamer and all those other things. But then father placed upon him that special robe. <coughs> now it wasn't a patchwork quilt because uh, uh, the, this robe that he, or this garment that he wore, in the Hebrew there, it's a little bit obscure, but possibly the uh, the best translation or the best idea that comes from it is that it was a distinctive garment as a garment of many colours would be distinctive but it was a distinctive garment in the sense that it was a garment that literally went to the extremities in other words it had long sleeves and a long skirt be quite a different sort of garment to the type of garments that his brothers would use be most impractical uh, rearing cattle and stock and the, in that valley of Hebron as they went up and down it and it was obviously a princely type of garment, a distinctive garment. But however, be that as it may, the father showed his, <coughs> father showed his uh, uh, choice of this son by giving him this garment. Now we're going to find out now at this part of the story, we're going to find out now some of the traits that come to the surface in his character that God was able to use and God was able to bless. The family lived in the valley of Hebron. They, they uh, herded their flocks and pastured their flocks up and down that valley. And one day they were at Shechem. In the Bible there are two Shechems. This particular Shechem that they went to was probably best part of 60 miles away from Hebron. And his brothers were in that area. Now if you read the earlier chapters of Genesis, there was a feud between the men of Shechem and Joseph's brothers. They disgraced themselves there in earlier days, and the men of Shechem had sworn to take revenge. There was a feud. So that when they went back into that area, naturally, father was very uh, worried about his sons. And so in the 37th of Genesis, father sends this one to go and find out how his brothers are progressing. Because they were in a danger area. And so concerned was he that he was willing to let this one, that whom he highly esteemed and deeply loved, to let him go that long journey. 
if we wanted to spiritualize this of course and use our story tonight as a type I go on and I remember one who spared not his son who came from the courts of glory to the hostile Shechem of this world he came unto his own and his own received him not however Joseph makes that journey now when he gets to Shechem there at Shechem he meets a man and he discovers from that man that his brothers are perfectly safe now I suggest to you that at this part of the story that Joseph could have turned round and at that point gone home he would have fulfilled his father's purpose in sending him he discovered that they were safe out of the danger area he could have turned round and gone back home but no here comes something that to the surface that again I believe is part of that spiritual prosperity because when he told that his brothers were not at Shechem they'd gone on to Dothan which is another 12 miles he then went on to Dothan he went those extra 12 miles not those extra 2 miles as Jesus went but the extra 12 miles and there was I believe here this conscientious tray that went with this with this intelligence of his that God could use and God could bless we will see more about that a little later on and so at Dothan he went through that terrible experience of the pit and what his brothers did to him and then we come to the 39th chapter of Genesis where we find our text tonight Joseph now is in Egypt he is in the house of Potiphar captain of the guard and Joseph would find himself in a completely alien society it was absolutely everything was so different from what he had been taught at his father's knees because every Jewish boy is taught this there is one God or God is one Jehovah is his name and he is holy that's probably the world's shortest creed I know they talk about the Muslim creed but this is much older and it's much deeper there is one God or God is one Jehovah is his name and he is holy the first thing a Jewish boy learns about is the holiness of God not the love of God this world needs to know more about the holiness of God as well as the love of God and so he finds himself in a completely alien situation because what he finds is this he has been told there's only one God he comes down to Egypt and we know from secular history you can look up your encyclopedias it was riddled with temples everywhere every district had its temple every district had its deity and uh, or there were many many gods most of them were lady gods goddesses if you like and there were these gods and there were these temples and in these temples there were practices under the name of religion which were anything but holy there are many such practices that go on in some of the temples for instance in India places today the, um, where the idea of these fertility cults that's why God had to say when they went into the promised land that they had to utterly destroy it all it's heinous because under the name of religion practices were taking place that were anything but holy so Joseph finds himself in a completely alien situation but then there's a lovely phrase and God was with him now in the house of Potiphar he was in Potiphar's house somewhere about 11 years between 10 and 11 years he was 17 when he was put in the pit and uh, he was 28 when he went out of Potiphar's house so for about 10 or 11 years there he is in the house of this man when I say the word house I think in what we know of secular history I think we would substitute the word perhaps mansion or palace because you see it was Potiphar's uh, uh, duty and his uh, uh, commission that he was to preserve the life of the monarch right down through history it's still true today and we'll perhaps sometime in the next few hours on the news we'll get another example of it. it's always happening when you put power in a person's hand they are immediately the object of danger because others want to take power from them and in those olden days it was just the same as it is today heads of monarchs or heads rolled very easily and the way they did it in those days quite often was by poisoning 
That's why we had the cupbearer, and the cupbearer was always at the king's side, and he placed of great trust, like Nehemiah. So that the king turned around and says, you taste it first. He was in a place of great trust. And so here was a man who, who depended, whose life, livelihood was to defend the monarch. And I'm sure of this, that that house was a little bit more than what we would call today a semi, perhaps some three bedrooms. It, was a, it would be a mansion. And he found himself in this situation. A Hebrew, a young Hebrew slave comes into that home. But you only have to read a verse or two. We don't know the timing of it, except it all took place within a period of about 11 years. But it wasn't long before Joseph enters as the slave. It's not long before Joseph is the steward. Because the slave is the one who takes orders. The steward is the one who gives orders. And here again is this natural gift of his of being able, of it very intelligent and being able to organize. Obviously, Potiphar recognized it. And he obviously served Potiphar with the same conscientious spirit that he went those extra 12 miles to Dothan. I remember years ago, we don't hear this sort of talk today, but I'm, many of us here when we were young fellows, we used to be told concerning our secular occupation that we served our earthly masters as unto the Lord. Uh, you remember that? And uh, well, that, was, that was how we were to conduct ourselves. We, and I think it's true. We don't hear much of that today, I don't think. But uh, as unto the Lord. And I think it's that what Joseph did. Because you see, Joseph could have said to himself, Why am I here? Why did this happen to me? But he didn't. Not only was God with him, but the thing is this, that Joseph recognized that God was with him. How do I know? Later on, when eventually Joseph and his brothers are reunited, you remember how they were troubled in his presence. And Joseph said, don't upset yourself, don't trouble yourself because of me. It wasn't you that sent me here, it was God. And he recognized that the situation he was in, it was God's hand behind it. The perception, spiritual perception of the sovereignty of God. Well, that's another word that some areas of the church are not too keen upon today. The sovereignty of God. We live in a world where people walk around with banners claiming their right, and I've got this right to do this and do the other. I want to do what I want to do in my way. That's the attitude of the world. And it's very easy for that attitude to rub off on the Christians. Any attitude of the world, and especially with mass communication, we can subtly out noticing it. We can even find our minds thinking along these lines. But for the child of God, we have to constantly remind our hearts. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And we don't do what we want to do. Oh, we're left here to do what he wants us to do in simple obedience. As his son, who could say, I do always those things which please the Father, not please me. However, he recognized that God was moving behind the scenes. And I'll tell you this. That if you let the world into your soul and into your thinking, you'll soon forget about the hand of God. You'll soon be imperceptive to God moving. You'll put it down onto the lowest levels. Coincidence and all that sort of thing. But the man of God recognises the moving of God as he shifts the scene. So he was not only an intelligent young man, conscientious young man, uh, but he was one who recognized that God controlled his life. The Lord was with him. And it went on, it says this, in these ever-increasing circles I was talking about. There in Potiphar's house, it says in the end, Potiphar didn't know what he possessed. It says, the Lord blessed Potiphar's house for Joseph's sake. It's contagious, is true spiritual prosperity. It rubs off onto others. And Joseph was like that. And it says in the end that Potiphar didn't know what he possessed. It was all in the hands of Joseph. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? An unknown slave coming into these circumstances. And that's how it finished. Then, at the end of those 11 years, I expect uh, he'd been under test and under pressure many times. Satan doesn't leave the man or woman of God alone for 11 years. But it's highlighted because at the end of that time, of that period of his life, 
When Joseph is put under pressure, and we see how he reacts, when he is brought under tremendous temptation when he is alone through the lips of Potiphar's wife. And as he comes under this pressure and she makes this suggestion to him. Joseph, what does he do? He's been away from home 11 years. He's been taught at his father's knee there's one God and God is holy. When that great temptation comes to him, this great whisk, wind blows against his soul, what's the reaction? How can I do this thing and sin against God? Still there. The deep teaching, the deep conviction, he knew this, that sin, all sin, was against God. And he knew his God was a holy God. In the temples there were many things practices, practiced that were in this, in this area, in this realm. But now he knew his soul was kept. Guy was a prosperous man, the Lord was with him. The psalmist later on could say, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Joseph in a measure had in his heart that which he had been taught at his father's knee. The ways of God and the character of God. How much more privileged are we who've got such a, a thick Bible with all the word of God for us to read. In this world, oh, that's what we need. In this world with all its defilement, the washing of the word. Thank God for the day when I was washed from my guilt by that precious blood. But God has provided the daily remedy in this unholy world to keep our souls clean the washing of the word thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God many years ago when I first started what we might call my full time period of service for the Lord and many of you remember those days when I first began to serve the Lord and uh, it was one of the influencing factors in my life was uh, a brother that many of us will remember was Mr. Fred Elliott, a man that God used in many mighty ways. And I can remember when I first started out as just a young preacher and working amongst boys and girls, Mr. Elliott wrote me a very encouraging letter. And he wrote this at the end, and I've never forgotten these words, they burned into my soul. If she said, if you want to be blessed of the Lord, keep yourself a polished shaft. In other words, keep the life clean. And this is what Joseph did. And Joseph says, how can I do this thing and sin against God? And then he finds himself in prison. As he stood up now against these temptations, he finds himself in prison and he might ask himself again, why does this happen to me? But it says in prison the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him there. And Joseph recognised it. It was another part of the tapestry of life. It was another panel in his tapestry of life. And now he finds himself in prison. The human heart would say, Why this? Stood up for God and his righteousness, why should this happen to me? That's the end. There are many dear saints of God tonight behind prison bars who could say the same if they wished. Why am I here having witness for the Lord? But you know, God seems to turn prison for the believers into a very blessed place. As I study my Bible, I don't find any part of my Bible was ever written in any recognised seat of learning. Any college has written in all kinds of places. And there's a fair part of this scripture come to us, has come from the prison cell, hasn't it? And it would seem that when man cuts off his fellow man and punishes him, cuts him off from communication and fellowship with those outside and puts a wall between them, in some ways God uses it to a blessing because there's one thing they cannot do they cannot separate the believer from God and perhaps when he's separated from fellow men so often the believer in a sense has a very precious experience of God's presence perhaps to coin a phrase they may even experience what we might call the double portion of God's presence and I'm sure tonight that there are some children of God in prison who are experiencing things like that 
that they've never experienced outside. Prison is a place where God works. By the way, as you know, we have a little holiday uh, uh, in May, and uh, there's some details on the table there, and if there's any more details, we have a week where we take over Butlins, and some of you have been with us down there. Well, we should be down at Sussex Beach next, uh, this year, uh, in May, for a whole week, and if you'd like to have a week's fellowship with us. But what's reminded me about it is this. Um, uh, a very good friend of mine, that uh, he doesn't live very far from us, so often in our home, Mr. Fred Lemon. Many of you probably know of him and read his books. Well, Fred's going to be with us for that week. But, you know, he's coming into the studio actually next week, or week after. He's been working in many of the jails, you know, in Britain. And uh, I'm not letting out secrets, but there are at least four IRA men who have who are got 30-year sentences have been born again. I've seen their letters, I've seen them this week. One's written his testimony in lovely poetry. He's coming into the studio, we're going to put it all down on uh, tape in a week or two's time. But God works in prison. When man is alone and God can speak to him, get him alone. I think so often God too works in hospitals when people are from the normal circle of life withdrawn. And Joseph there in prison, what happened to him? What was, the, what was the lessons? God came and through God coming to him, he was able to reveal secrets, the dreams, etc. And it would seem that there he, uh, God came and he was came into this idea of perceptions. God trusted him with secrets. God doesn't trust everybody with secrets. It is lovely when God does give us something very precious and personal. And there we know the prison experience. And suddenly, he's in the palace. You know, in that prison... In those ever-increasing circles, I don't know of a, a secular story that's parallel with this. If you know of one, tell me afterwards. I'd be interested to know. But if I read that right concerning Joseph, he went in as a prisoner and he finishes up as the jailer. Because he was in charge of all the prisoners. They gave him the keys. Now what prisoner did they ever do that to? There must have been something dynamic about this character that you could fully trust. Man of God trustworthy Potiphar saw it and others saw it now they're in the jail and then he finds himself eventually we know the reason why in the palace when he's in the palace there he is in the spotlight he's in the limelight and all the adulation is on Joseph as he stands there before Pharaoh I would suggest to you that if he had succumbed to Potiphar's wife's wishes in that house he would have never found himself in the palace but now he finds himself in the palace those that honour me God says I will honour now he's in a wider circle than he's ever been before now he's in a situation pot of his house well that's peanuts now to what area he is now he's, he's, in, he's in the palace and they say can we find such a man as this is can we find a, such a wonderful chap as this and he's in the limelight and suddenly he says whoa hang on a minute it wasn't me that interpreted the dream or recalled the dream it was God the Holy Spirit he was in that situation where the chest normally would swell and the head would begin to swell when he's the focus of all the admiration that's the human heart but the man or the woman of God in such a situation I believe he's clothed with something which God uses true humility because when he switches the limelight away he says not me my master in heaven when John the Baptist they said to John the Baptist look you're losing your followers now John what do you think about it I must decrease he must increase John was clothed with a camel hair garment what clothed his body there was a parallel garment of humility that clothed his spirit here's another reason why God could prosper Joseph that we might be low at his feet that he might raise us up if we're going to do anything for the Lord whether it be as a local assembly or church as you plan or whether it's something individual if I want to be the big shot 
If I want to be in charge, if I want to be in the forefront, if I want to be seen, if I want the adulation, beware. That's the thinking of this world. God honours those of his own choice, choosing. And when God lifts a soul up, there's no doubt about it. When God sets his seal upon his man or woman for the time or for the moment. God bless it. So here he is. He's dressed then, they give him a garment, they give him all those rings. Give him the signet ring. How work. Now, he says, says Pharaoh, you're only second to me. Pharaoh with all his power in the ancient world. And you've got the signet ring. And you give the final signature to the laws. Now, he was 30 years of age when that took place. He's given a Gentile bride if you want to carry on the type, etc. He was 30 years of age. But we read tonight, he was 110 when he died. So if my arithmetic's right, there's another 80 years to think about. Those 80 years are rather condensed. But in those 80 years, there's still ever widening circles of impact for good to others. Because God was blessing him. Wasn't he the saviour of the ancient world? With his super intelligence of administering and, and of organising the harvests, etc. And all this that God had given his natural talents, God had blessed it and was using it. And now he becomes the saviour of the ancient world. And through it, in the end, his family are with him. They are given an inheritance in Egypt. The land of Goshen, a very fertile part where they get the most moisture. And there in that area, the family are there. They're there for 80 years. And he comes to the end of his life. This intelligent, conscientious, holy living, humble man. Man of God's choice. The prosperous man. How does he feel at the end of his life? Now comes the hallmark and the crowning aspect of what I want to leave with you tonight. That man comes to 110 years of age and his spiritual eyesight is undim. His spiritual eyesight is absolutely clear. When he comes to the end of his days and he gets his family around him, he says, remember this. This is not your home. This is not where God's promises end in Egypt. He says God has said again and reaffirmed the God of Isaac and Jacob etc. He's the God of promise and he says this is not our home. It used to be a piece we used to sing years ago. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I haven't heard it recently but we used to sing that didn't we one time. That's true. We can get very comfortable in the Egypt of this world. We can get very comfortable in our own little Goshens. But if we're going to do anything for the Lord, it's going to be, it's costly, it's sacrificial. My mother used to say to me when I was a boy, you know, if it doesn't cost you much, it may not be worth much. And that which is precious to the Lord is that which costs. If it's only the widow with her two mites, it costs. And this one, he lived that sacrificial life. He gave himself. And so Joseph says you don't stay here. And I'm sure that they had some nice houses. I'm sure that they had pretty good property. Because he remember. He was in such a position of power. He was in a position to be able to give it to them. But material things you've got to leave behind. There's a land of promise. And Joseph dies with a command. A command of faith. He says, I'm coming with you. I want you to embalm me and put me in a coffin, ready for transport. It was a century or two, wasn't it, before he went? But he died in the blaze of glory of his faith undimmed. Like Stephen and his martyrdom, he saw Jesus standing. And everything else recedes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And Joseph, as it were, goes out in that blaze of glory. 
God prospered him. God was with him. And as we look at that life, we find the ultimate, that's why I went on to Joshua. Eventually they're in the promised land. None of those that were in Egypt with Joseph were in the promised land, but physically in that sense. But Joseph's taken for the others for the line of faith. They find he's in jo there and he's in Shechem. There, as the place at Shechem, you know, is a lovely place. It's a place where God often spoke to people in that area, in that valley, the foot of that mountain. You know, it was there where Esau renewed his vows to God. It was there where Joshua renewed his vows and had the word of God read. It was there where Jesus met a woman by the well. What a lovely meeting that was. All in the same area. And there in that area, it says they buried Joseph's body, bones, and it was an inheritance for his family. After he'd gone, he left an inheritance. Well, we could spiritualize many things from that. But Joseph was a prosperous man. When his father on his deathbed gave the patriarchal blessing, he said this concerning Joseph. Joseph was a fruitful bough, a tree by a well or by water whose branch and fruit's gone over the wall. How wonderful was that life, brought up in the obscurity of the mohair tents of Hebron, and he finds himself eventually in the blaze and limelight of the ancient world, Egypt and beyond. The fruit's gone over the wall, others have picked, others have been blessed by him. Wherever he went, men and women were blessed. All oh, that God might say that of us, both as individuals and as a church. Thinking of a particular effort to come in later days should the Lord tarry. Or that many around this area may pick the fruit and they by the hand of faith that we may be a blessing to the district. The Lord may bless them for our sake. No other reason not to increase our numbers not to display our building much as this is a lovely display for the Lord but that he might have fruit to pick for himself that the Lord might have his portion and have his joy he's a fruitful bough that's gone over the wall and father didn't, wasn't finished there he said but then he says and his bow abode in strength when they taught a boy to, to pull a bow you know if you string a bow it's not an easy thing and the bows here is nothing like the bits of uh, cane and a bit of string that we used to play with when we were boys and making bows and arrows. I've got a proper bow. And then when a boy was taught by his dad from the youngest days, they were taught to shoot the bow. They would put the bow on the ground, or on father's foot actually. And the boy would take the bow and father would put his arms round him. And father stretched the bow. It was father's strength that extended the bow. The boy was too weak to it. And then the boy just put the arrows on the, on the hand and he learned to shoot and aim. The strength wasn't his own, it was outside himself. It was the arm of his arm. Joseph was a polished shark. Joseph lied, but it was the strength of the Lord and the mighty arms. Around. The Lord was with him. And it's only his strength that the tar arrows will find their target. When God has his hand upon the bow. Joseph was a prosperous man. The Lord was with him. May I wish you a prosperous new year. Amen. Shall we sing a hymn together? 624. Oh the bitter shame. Heavenly Father, in the name of the one who could truthfully say, I do always those things which please the Father. In his name we pray that thy word and thy spirit may challenge our hearts, may indeed allow us to bend at his feet. Lord, our heart's desire is that we might bring joy to thee both as individuals 
and the various assemblies we represent and in so doing that we might be a blessing to this needy world around. Keep our souls, Lord, from the defilement of this unholy Egypt. Grant that we may be polished shafts for thy glory. Amen. Amen.